and it's easy for us to sort of think, oh, I'm not like super overweight or I don't use my phone that much and sort of fool ourselves into believing that it's not a problem. So how do we not do that? Because it's so easy. It's very easy. I think one thing that's good is that from the 12th edition, the 12th version of iOS, um, Apple's operating system, there was feedback built in now. So you used to have to download a special dedicated app that would tell you how long you were spending using your platform. So I used to do that before iOS 12. With iOS 12, it's a default feature. So it's very easy to get feedback, at least on phone use now, and what you're doing with your time. Now, one, one interesting thing um, is that when you ask people to guess how long they're spending on their phones, almost everyone underestimates by a lot. We usually think it's about half of what it is. So the first time I ever tried to guess without knowing, I thought it was 90 minutes. And it, it actually, for me, it's between three and five hours, depending on when and what I'm doing. It's a huge amount of time. And if you don't realize that, if you don't have the feedback, you don't have concrete numbers, and you rely on intuition alone, you're going to be led astray, right? I thought 90 minutes, that's not good, but it's not terrible. But five hours a day, that's 35 hours a week or something like that. It's absolutely absurd. Across the lifespan, that's going to end up being 15, 20 years of my life I'm going to be spend, spending staring at a screen. It's just absurd. So I, you need the feedback first. That's the first thing is you've got to kind of be motivated. You've got to know this is an issue. Um, and, and then you've got to start to think about the opportunity cost. So what else could I be doing with that time? For some people, it's about productivity. They realize they're not as productive as they should be. And so then it's a matter of carving out an extra hour a day to do work instead of spending time staring at the screen. For some people, it's about social connection. You know, you feel, you feel lost, um, like you don't have strong social networks and relationships. I think that's especially acute during the pandemic when we've been forced to physically distance ourselves, not socially distance necessarily, but physically distance ourselves from people. Um, and so with that, with those two pieces of information, how long you're spending and what else you could be doing with that time, I think most of us get to the point where we say, this is not ideal. There are things I could be doing differently. Hello, Adam. Welcome to the Rion Talks, man. Great having you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Antonio. I wanted to start by asking you, when did you notice that this issue of uh, phone addiction was a very important problem in our society today? I, I think it, 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 was, uh, it first affected me in the early 2010s. So I got my first smartphone in 2009. And, um, and in the beginning, I didn't really use it very much. I used it for email occasionally, but I felt that it didn't have much of a hold over me. I wasn't using it for gaming. Um, I wasn't doing that much with it. And, and by, by maybe 2011, 12, 13, I, I, you know, I was, I was dating who, the woman who eventually became my wife. And I, I realized we were sitting on the couch next to each other and watching TV and on our phones. And, you know, a whole evening would pass. And, and we wouldn't say a word to each other. And it just felt really strange to me that that's the way we were now living our lives. And, and I, I thought a lot of it was about screens. To some extent, TVs, which had been around for a long time, but really it was that we were each doing separate things on our phones next to each other, often with the TV screen off. Um, so, I, so I think it's been probably, for me, a decade, maybe even more than a decade now that, that uh, this has been an issue. And I think for society, you know, the first smartphones came about in, were, the first iPhones were introduced in 2007, so that's 14 years ago. I think that's roughly when this became, started to become a really big issue. And was it then that you realized, oh, I have to do something about this when you were sitting with your wife? Or was it something that you started to tackle gradually? It was gradual. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't think much of it at first. I, you know, the first thing that happens if you're a, a researcher like I am is you ask yourself, a few questions. So the first question is, is this just peculiarly about me? Is it just me or is this everybody? The second question is, how narrow or broad is this? You know, like um, I remember playing a video game on my phone, a smartphone game um, between Los Angeles and New York. So I was flying and I was playing the game and realized that I was playing for, for hours and hours and hours on the flight, maybe six hours in a row. And 
I, I sort of wondered, is this something about the game? Is it something about the platform? Is this something that is just about me playing this game? And I realized that there are lots of people playing lots of games, doing lots of things on their phones. And so once I realized how broad the problem was and how much it cut across different categories of experiences, you know, from email to texting to WhatsApp to social media, it's everything. Um, I realized that it was a big enough problem that I wanted to really investigate it. And I think the biggest thing that drove me to really ask lots of questions about it was reading that a lot of the tech titans themselves, you know, the, the people at the heads of these very big tech companies, when you ask them how they use tech at home, especially how they use it around their kids, they're very, very careful. So they, they say things like, you know, I, I sell this product, but I wouldn't let my kids go near it, which sounds very strange. Um, and so that's when I started to really investigate it much more deeply. Yeah, it's super hypocritical that they don't allow their kids to use it and then they're marketing it and selling it. What psychological factors are at play here whenever we're using social media, for example, that are so dangerous? Yeah, I think there are a lot of different things. Um, when we talk about products and why people use products, I think there are two big questions. One is, how do you get people in the door? So what, what gets them to start using the product? But then a question that's often overlooked, historically at least, is once they're in the door, how do you keep them there? How do you stop them from going to the next thing? And I think a lot of business people focus a lot on getting people in the door and focus much less on retention and keeping people engaged. The biggest change with the screens that we use today is that they are, they're, they're good at getting you in the door, but what they do incredibly well is they keep you there. So, you know, humans tend to be inert, which basically means we do the same thing over and over and over until something tells us to do the next thing. We're, we're pretty, you know, mostly we run on automatic Um, and what that means is you, you do this thing, whether it's going to be using a screen, whether it's going to be watching TV, whatever it is, until you either inside your head say to yourself, oh, I should probably just stop doing this. You know, like if you're sitting watching the TV in a room where you can see the sunlight and suddenly it gets dark and you look outside and you say, oh, time's passing. I need to do something different. That's an external cue that's that kind of generates that need to move on. One of the things that I think tech companies have learned from casinos is you can get people to do things like playing slot machines in a casino for much longer if you make it hard for them to tell what the time is, you don't give them a signal, you know, make it impossible for them to see daylight, you make sure there are no clocks around. Um, and so this is, this is something similar to what a lot of tech companies have done. You know, the bottomless feed on your social media scroll, um, your social media feed, the, the bottomlessness of that where it just keeps going and going and going means that you're never going to hit the bottom because when you hit the bottom, that's a subtle s signal that maybe you want to move on. It's the same as video games that just have you know, so many levels that you can never get to the end of them. And when you finish them, the, the creator of the game adds new levels. Um, it's, it's like watching content on, say, YouTube or Netflix or Hulu where you get to the end of the show and immediately the next thing starts playing. So it's all of these little subtle things that are built in to kind of undermine our ability to say, I should stop now, I should move on to the next thing. So, so that's, you know, that I could go on for hours about these hooks, but for me, the biggest one, the most important one is that these companies have worked out a way to stop us from saying, oh, I should go, go to the next thing. That's what they've done better than I think any companies that I can think of in history. And it's not like they had a science team or something. They just started A-B testing these things until they became perfect, basically. It's both. So they do have, a lot of them do work with scientists. So there are some, some cues and, and there are some principles you can use. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if I wanted to do this, if one of the big companies came to me and said, well, how do we build a, a, an engine for a, a system that we don't want people to stop using? I would say, well, here are 10 things. And I would be, I'd be able to give them a recipe book. And then they would be able to bake all of those features into the product. And I can't guarantee the product will be a success because there's a lot that goes into what makes a, a product successful. But But I would, I would certainly be able to dramatically increase the chances of, of success. So there's that. But you're right. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be someone who understands humans. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have great theories about how people think. All you need is access to, to billions of data points or even millions of data points. So if I have a product and I know that I have a million users, I can have, I can A-B test two versions of the product and have 500,000 use one version, 500,000 use the other, and then I discover version A is better. Then I say, well, all right, I'm going to do away with version B, but now I'm going to have a version A, A1 and A2, and then I A-B test that, and then I realize A1 is better. Then I have A1.1, and you keep going, and so 20 generations later, you've, you've weaponized this 
platform or product so that it's really, it's been engineered to be as difficult to resist as possible. And that's what a lot of these companies have been doing. So when, when you open Amazon, when you open Facebook, when you open Google, the, the user experience as it arrives on your desktop or on your phone, nothing about that is accidental. It's all through combat where lots of versions that fell by the wayside have been abandoned and what reaches you is, is the weaponized version that's maximally difficult for you to resist. And when you say weaponized version, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I say weaponized because, you know, when you're trying to create a, something that's a weapon or that's that's kind of dangerous, you, you keep refining it over time if you want it to be sharp and powerful. And I think that's what's happening with these platforms is they are ter- they're being turned into weapons where they, they are increasingly just refined fine-tuned to the point where what you what you're experiencing is the very kind of best version with none of the worst features or none of the mediocre features and they're weaponized because they become um weapons against your defenses to to prevent your attention from being hacked so that i think weaponized is really the right term because what i'm trying to do when i use a platform is i want to go and get the best out of it and then i want to leave go back to my life, right? For me, tech is about utility. It's about what the, some, sometimes tech allows you to do something you couldn't do otherwise, but most of the time it's about just making the world slightly better and more convenient and easier. So Google Maps, I use my Google Maps app, I get to where I'm going and then I put it aside. That's the best of technology. But imagine if Google app Maps were like Facebook or were like Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or Clubhouse or anything else where you're just constantly encouraged to keep going and going and going. That's a weaponized version of Google Maps. Now, the version of social media platforms that we use in most games as well, those are weaponized because they have become the versions where, yes, you get the good stuff, but then you keep going through all the bad stuff and you can't say, okay, I'm done, I need to move on. So I think I think weaponized just describes the fact that they have managed to find a way around your attentional defenses, and so you keep using them. So we really should be watching out for social media and games, basically. I think you should watch out watch out for anything that has an endless engine. So anything that scrolls and that you don't reach a bottom. So Facebook, when it first came out, and when they first had the news feed, you'd get to the bottom of the screen and it would say, click here to load more or load more, and you'd have to click on that, that button. That's not true anymore. Um, YouTube, when it was first introduced in 2005, there was a lot of friction between each video. You'd watch a video, then you'd search for a new one. Then you'd watch a video and you'd search for a new one. You'd watch Netflix. You, there was friction. You had to go from one episode and hit play to watch the next one. Anything that you do where you can see that they've in, kind of intentionally worked out a way to remove those those barriers between each consumption episode, that's a time, I think, to be wary and to ask yourself, what are they trying to do here? It so happens that it's easy to do that for social media because there's a lot of content and it's it's social content, which is very intrinsically interesting to us. That's true for email, it's true for messaging apps, it's true for games, it's true for the news. News companies do this. Cable TV in the US is is like that. I'm sure it's like that all around the world where something happens and 30 years ago we would have read an article on that thing and then we would have got on with our lives. Now we'll watch the TV for like 24 hours a day just consuming the same images, talking heads, people telling us the same stuff over and over again. We don't learn anything new but we feel like we're, we're eating and really what we're eating is just empty calories. It's just absolute crap. And I think that's where you ask yourself, why am I doing this? And uh, is this good for me? Is there any value that comes from it? And I'd say most of the time the answer is no, there are better things to be done with your time. I watched one of your interviews with Malcolm Gladwell, it was really interesting. And you guys were talking about like addictions that we've seen throughout history, like smoking cigarettes and this new addiction that we have now that is the screen. What's the difference between the two and is the screen more dangerous, something novel, or is this something that was just bound to happen? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the, the, the thing that Malcolm and I were talking about, this is a few years ago, it's about four years ago we had that conversation, but what we were talking about was, I think moral panics, this idea that there are things that come up time and time and time again, you know, Books, people said when books first came out, this is a problem, it's going to destroy our brains. And then they, they 
saw TV in the 50s and said, TV is going to destroy our brain, which is probably true. Then they saw pinball machines and said, video games are going to destroy our brains and arcade machines and consoles and the Nintendo and, you know, it just keeps going. So, so one question is, it, it seems like none of these things have really destroyed our brain. We still seem to be functioning as a species, mostly, maybe reduced in some senses, but we really are sort of still doing okay. You know, our economies are still doing fine and companies and countries and whatever um, societies seem to be thriving despite all of that. So, so what are we concerned about? So what the issue there really is, um, when we talked about addiction historically, we used to think of addiction as, as just restricted to substances, things that you ingest into the body, things like nicotine, tobacco, uh, nicotine, tobacco, um, alcohol, um, prescription medication, um, illicit drugs, narcotics, things like that. Um, and when you ingest those into the body, you get this very, very strong physiological response. There's a rush of dopamine, it feels good, and then it feels bad, and then you get withdrawal, and then you get tolerance, and they're all, there's this cascade of responses. Um, and for a very long time, people believed addiction could only arise from, from substances. Now, I think with first gambling, I think it was the first time with certain gambling devices that we were able to hack that kind of system where you didn't need to ingest anything. It was just a behavior. And the behavior itself, the experience was so compelling that it could engender addiction-like responses. Um, and that, I think, has now become true for a lot of what we do on our phones as well, where addiction is you do something over and over again. You really want to do it in the moment, even though you know it's probably bad for you in the long run. It could be bad for you because it's destroying your social relationships, because it's destroying your financial well-being, because it's destroying your physical health. You know, there are stories of people who play video games for weeks on end. They put on tons of weight. They get very unhealthy. They don't see the sunlight. Um, and then it can also destroy your psychological health. A lot of people use social media platforms and find that they become lonely and anxious and depressed. Um, they experience bullying. Um, there's a rise in the suicide rate that some people suggest, and I think it's, there's some truth to this, may be driven in part, especially among teenage girls, by exposure to social media, um, which causes a lot of, a lot of problems. So, um, so that's what I was talking about with Malcolm. It's this, this rise of a new kind of addiction, and I, I do think it's the right term to use for these experiences, despite the fact that they don't involve the ingestion of a substance the way you know, traditional addictions did. And it's easy for us to sort of think, oh, I'm not like super overweight or I don't use my phone that much and sort of fool ourselves into believing that it's not a problem. So how do we not do that? Because it's so easy. It's very easy. I think one thing that's good is that from the 12th edition, the 12th version of iOS, um, Apple's operating system, there was feedback built in now. So you used to have to download a special dedicated app that would tell you how long you were spending using your platform. So I used to do that before iOS 12. With iOS 12, it's a default feature. So it's very easy to get feedback, at least on phone use now, and what you're doing with your time. Now, one, one interesting thing um, is that when you ask people to guess how long they're spending on their phones, almost everyone underestimates by a lot. We usually think it's about half of what it is. So the first time I ever tried to guess without knowing, I thought it was 90 minutes. And it, it actually, for me, it's between three and five hours, depending on when and what I'm doing. It's a huge amount of time. And if you don't realize that, if you don't have the feedback, you don't have concrete numbers, and you rely on intuition alone, you're gonna be led astray, right? I thought 90 minutes, that's not good, but it's not terrible. But five hours a day, that's 35 hours a week or something like that, it's absolutely absurd. Across the lifespan, that's gonna end up being 15, 20 years of my life I'm gonna be spend, spending staring at a screen. It's just absurd. So I, you need the feedback first. That's the first thing is you've gotta kind of be motivated. You've gotta know this is an issue. Um, and, and then you've got to start to think about the opportunity cost. So what else could I be doing with that time? For some people, it's about productivity. They realize they're not as productive as they should be. And so then it's a matter of carving out an extra hour a day to do work instead of spending time staring at the screen. For some people, it's about social connection. You know, you feel, you feel lost, um, like you don't have strong social networks and relationships. I think that's especially acute during the pandemic when we've been forced to physically distance ourselves, not socially distance necessarily, but physically distance ourselves from people. Um, and so with that, with those two pieces of information, how long you're spending and what else you could be doing with that time, I think most of us get to the point where we say, this is not ideal. There are things I could be doing differently. 
and this is a problem, especially I have a 16 year old sister and she always justifies her phone use by saying, oh, but I'm bored. And whenever she's bored, she just picks up the phone, TikTok, Instagram, you name it. Is there a problem with never being bored? Like every time you're bored, just grabbing the phone and entertaining yourself some way? Yeah, I, I think I think there is a problem. Um, I don't think it's like a massive problem. You asked this question when you asked about the interview with Malcolm Gladwell about is this more serious? Is this inevitable? I don't think these these addictions and the you know not being bored. I don't think there are problems like being a, a heroin addict is a problem. I think that's much more dangerous. The thing is that affects a small part of the population. Historically, those addictions to things like heroin were a minority of the population. What we're talking about here is a less severe, less acute form of addiction, but that affects like, you know, like 60, 70% of the population. I mean, most of us. So, so the question is on mass, is this a problem? So the question about boredom is an interesting one. If you go back in time and you look at where a lot of the best ideas in history came from, a lot of them came from people letting their minds wander and in, in dealing with a problem. They were bored or they had a moment to think. Now, what, what phones do for us is the minute you are in an elevator, for example, and you, or you're, you, know, you have a minute in a car or you're in a subway or a train or whatever, you pick up the phone and it, it brings entertainment to you. And when it does that, you short circuit any mind wandering that might be valuable. You know, you're not actually letting your mind do the thing that it needs to do when it's bored. That, that leads to a lot of what we think of as these great inventions, great ideas, like phenomenal products, solutions to major world problems, policy changes, things like that. And so I think if you think about this happening across the population of billions of people, we are, we're effectively um, chopping off early on before they get to rise tall enough to be really great ideas, these ideas in their germination period. They're young ideas, they're half formed, and then we get bored and say, all right, give me the phone. And so I think we're, we're just we're losing a lot of what could be by by papering over that feeling of boredom with our phones. And that's a problem. I also think there's something very healthy about being able to sit with your own thoughts, being able to grapple with your own thoughts and ideas. It's just a matter of sort of becoming a more complete human being, that you're you're able to just tolerate your own thoughts. It's not a painful experience. And I think you have to learn to do that. Um, and for, for generations and generations, humans did that. We just don't do it anymore. So young people hate having to just think. And actually, so do all the people these days. <laughs> and it could be because, like, sometimes we associate, like, whenever you think a bad thought, like, oh, I want to, I don't know, push this person. And that's not necessarily you wanting to do that. You just had that one thought and then it stays in your mind for a while. And then people, I don't know, I don't know how to explain why we want to escape our thoughts so much that nowadays we're barely ever sitting with our thoughts unless we like practice meditation or purposely put our phone in uh, the closet or wherever. It seems silly, but I think thinking is hard. I, I just think it's hard and it's more, more energy than we want to expend. So using a phone and playing a game or scrolling through a social media feed, if you had to put that on an energy scale from zero to a hundred, that's like a one. It's like a one out of a hundred. It's incredibly easy. It's very, it's, it visits itself upon you. It's not taxing. It doesn't require much from you. You can be mindless and do it. You can probably multitask. You can probably listen to music while you're doing it. It's just, it's incredibly easy to do. Sitting and thinking, especially when it's directed thought, when you actually try to think about a specific target issue, that's not a one. That's harder than a one. Now, if your baseline is a one, if that's what you're used to, your equilibrium most of the time you spend at a one, and then you suddenly have to do something that's a 10 or a 20, let's say it's 10 times harder, that feels exhausting. We're just not, the muscle that you need to be able to do that is not being exercised. It's like, it's like willpower, as you know, there are always these metaphors for muscles that you, you train over time. Obviously, you train your body, you get your body to be strong over time, but your mind is, is similar in a lot of respects, that you get better if you... If you, I, I can tell you that as a child before smartphones, I knew probably a hundred phone numbers. They were all embedded in my head. I could remember them without trying. That was a muscle that I had exercised. If you ask me to remember a hundred phone numbers today, I don't even know where to begin. I'd struggle. That'd be really hard. I'd need you to give me like a week to learn them. 
And even then I'd probably forget them. But that was trivial for everyone back then. And I think that's what phones are doing. They're, they're taking those skills that used to be seen as taken for granted and they now feel hard or we can't imagine that we ever were able to do that. I think we're just sort of operating our brains at this kind of very reduced state. And, and that seems problematic to me. And, and education sort of, I feel, has to adapt to that because if we don't need to memorize so many things now, is ha are having exams where you have to memorize everything, is that as useful as it was before since everything is so accessible? I know it's a muscle, but what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, there's always this question about the value of particular things you do at school or in university or whatever. Um, I've never been convinced that rote memorization is, is necessarily a good thing. I think it's good to be able to remember things. I think training your memory is not a bad thing to do. We know that it doesn't make you more competent in other areas, but I just think it's good It's good to be able to remember a phone number or something like that. that that's about where it ends. Um, my exams in class are always open book. So I don't, I don't really believe in this idea of, of having to really cram information in your head. Um, even when they're not open book, I give students the chance to bring in a single piece of paper with notes on it. Because if there's like an acronym they need to remember or a theory or whatever, I, don't, I want them to be able to apply it. I don't care if they can remember it. Because as you say, the problem today is we're spoiled with information. There's so much information. So you're never going to be in a situation where you're like, how do I find that out? Because it's so easy to find things out. What you might not be able to do is to say, now that I have that knowledge, what do I do with it? So I think application is much more important than, than simple understanding of a concept. Um, that should be trained much more. And so that's what I try to train in my classroom, my classroom at, uh, at NYU. Uh, so on the one hand, I think you're right. You know, rote memorization, probably not that valuable as a skill, but there's something about just the act of being forced to memorize. I think it made me a, a more competent human being. I remember studying for exams and, and my mind was really sharp when I was doing that. There's also this amazing evidence that it judges in the high courts of, of countries around the world, a lot of them are quite elderly. They're very, um, in the ends of their careers, in the United States, in the, in the Supreme Court, you, you don't have to retire. In Australia, where I'm from, um, you have to retire at 70 from the high court. The Supreme Court in the US, a lot of the judges go into their 80s, their 90s, and being forced to do the kinds of mental activities that younger people have to do, I'm sure, and I think there's some evidence to suggest that keeps their, them mentally more sharp. So I think there's value in, in memorization just to keep yourself generally sharp. But is it useful in the world, the way the world's structured today? Not really. I don't think so. Uh, I completely agree with you. And sort of using social media as like the complete opposite end of the spectrum is literally your mind is an idol. It is. I, I just, I, I live a long way from a lot of people who, who are important to me, people I love. Um, and it's important to me, if I think about the value of social media, a lot of the value comes from, from being able to connect with people who are not physically nearby. Now, during the pandemic, even people down the road were not physically nearby because you couldn't see them. Um, so there was great value in having a digital way to communicate with them. But during normal times, people you can see face to face, it's better to see them face to face. Then there's a set of people you would like to be able to see face to face who maybe live in a different country or a different part of the country, you can't see them. So there's certainly value there. But most of what I find that I do on, on Facebook, I don't really use it, but when I do, it's not enriching. I don't feel like, oh, you know, now I feel close to this person again. If I really care about the person, I'm going to pick up the phone, we'll have a call or we'll have a FaceTime call or whatever. But most of the time, I just I just don't find that I get that much from the experience. I don't. Sometimes I think about this, like how do I feel be, when I begin to use the platform and how do I feel when I'm done? And at the end, do I feel like I've connected to people? Have I learned something about them? Do I really feel like I've got something important and nourishing and enriching from the experience? And the answer is almost never yes. Sometimes I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting, but it, it never rises above that very, very low level. So what, aside from asking yourself, okay, how do I feel after using social media, for example, what other sort of ground rules can we implement to have a better relationship with our phones and just screens in general? Um, you just need to cultivate habits. I think we often think that we can rely on... Um, willpower or 
the ability to say no, self-control, it's just never going to work for us. We're all too busy. We have too many things going on. We're, we're often fatigued. We don't sleep enough. You know, there are all these reasons that it's very it's difficult for us to say, I'm going to use this and then in 10 minutes I'm going to stop. So what you need to do is to make sure that you don't have to rely on willpower and self-control in the first place. So how do you do that? If you're worried that you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and use your phone and that it's going to affect how you sleep, make sure the phone's not in your, your bedroom. It's that simple. So that when it's far away, there's no question of self-control because you can't reach the phone. Um, the same is true for things like dinner time. You know, if, you, if you're having dinner with someone, or even if you're on your own, you can do this. Um, and, and you think it's, you know, the, the temptation of the phone is such that it's going to get in the way of your enjoyment of the social experience. You can have a rule, and the rule is it's a habit, right? There's a box next to the table. Everyone puts the phone in the box. And a lot of classrooms do this as well. You know, if the teacher doesn't want the children to have a phone in the classroom, they have a box. Everyone puts their phone in the box, and they collect it at the end. So there's something very physical. It's very it's an analog solution to a digital problem. It's basically saying the best thing we can do as humans if there's something we don't want to use is to make it hard to reach. And the problem with phones is, like I've shown you, I've picked my phone up several times while we've been talking. They are always around us. You know, most people can reach their phones 24 hours a day. When they're asleep, it's next to the bed. When they're awake, it's in the pocket, in the backpack or whatever. You don't have to move your feet. You just reach over and it's, it's within arm's reach. It's basically functionally implanted. It is a part of your brain. So that to the extent that you can distance yourself from your phone and make that untrue for at least part of the day, that's, a, that's valuable. So I will intentionally kind of lose my phone. Like I'll leave it in a room and then leave it there and hope, hope it's a long time before I think about it again. Um, on the weekend, I'll put my phone on airplane mode so that I can use it as a camera. But um, from like nine to five on, on a Saturday sometimes, I won't have my phone on at all. I won't get emails, I won't get texts. I just won't get anything. And that's fine. People say things like, but what if someone really needs to reach you? But humans may do for you know, thousands of years without people being able to reach you instantly and they got by. So yes, occasionally you're going to regret the fact that you didn't have your phone on, but 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to turn it on at the end of the day and you're going to say, oh, there's some stuff I missed. Am I worse off for having missed it? Probably not. In fact, I'm probably better off because I actually enjoyed my day and was fully immersed in it. We should definitely appreciate that we can do that now, that we can distance ourselves from our technology. But from what I see in the future, things like Neuralink, I don't know, glasses, or maybe in the near future, we're not going to be able to distance ourselves from technology so easily. It might be part of us, literally. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the main reasons why we need to work out how to combat this issue while we are still dealing with this kind of very, what in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, this, the phone is going to look primitive, right? It, right now, it's the cutting edge. You know, I buy my new iPhone and I'm like, look at this. this I can do all of these things in the palm of my hand. It's a miracle. But it's soon you're right. It's going to be, an, we'll have implants, right? It'll be Neuralink. It'll be glasses. It'll be virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, we will live most of our lives in a digital space, perhaps. And that sounds completely dystopian to me. That sounds like a terrible way for our species to go. I think there's a good chance we're moving in that direction. And the question is, can we develop certain skills now that will allow us to manage that effectively so we don't give up our humanity completely because we're living in this digital landscape? You know, if, if you, there's this really interesting evidence that if, if two people are sitting in a room and they've never met before and you take a phone and you put it upside down on the table between them, and you ask them to have a conversation, they will have a worse conversation, they will connect more poorly, and they will form a weaker relationship than if there is no phone on the table, if it's a book. Because the phone reminds them there's another world out there, they, it makes them distracted, it's priming them to think about their own phones, or what else they're missing out on. And that's, that's a problem, I think. That's just the presence of the phone. But imagine when instead of the presence of a phone that's distracting us, imagine we're in the same room, sitting behind our oculi, whatever we're using, whatever it's going to be, I, I think it's it's going to be really difficult for us to decide, you know what, I'm going to put my glasses down and live in the real world and actually connect with someone. And that's what we're trying to train ourselves to do now while we still can. I, I love the approach you've taken because it's not an extreme. You still see the value in the technology. You still use it in your day-to-day. 
but I feel like I don't know why now we just love choosing one one extreme or another. And I feel that as we see Neuralink start to get implemented and other type of implants, we're also going to start to see the other new age extreme where people don't want to like are not going to utilize this technologies and they're going to go live in the forest. And I feel like that's going to be a movement also. Probably. Yeah. And you always, you always find, I mean, there's a kind of pendulum that swings with all new things. So with the rise of new technologies at first, everyone says this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. And then you get the backlash, the pendulum swings the other way. And the pendulum swings more forcefully, the more it swings one way in the, in the beginning, in the first instance. So, you know, to the extent that something is really a profound change and a profound difference from what we were used to before, that's going to get a more powerful backlash. So even now, you know, I wrote my book um, a few years ago and, and immediately I started to get messages from people, most of them emails saying, I don't use tech. I long time ago, I decided not to use, I don't know why they're emailing me, but most of them, they, some of them say, you know, this is an exception. I'm emailing you to tell you this. Some of them sent me actual letters in the mail to say, this is, you know, this is what I've decided. I, I don't have a TV. I don't have a phone. I don't use any technology at all. And it's like the, the defining feature of their existence is this thing because they can't have a normal social relationship. They can't make phone calls. It's very hard for them to hold down a job. How do you do all that without technology? How do you travel, right? It's very, very hard. I mean, you probably can do it. It's just I, you'd have to go, what, you go to a travel agency, you order the ticket, you get a paper ticket. It's just not the way we do things anymore. It's really an uphill battle. And the infrastructure just isn't there to live with paper anymore. So I think someone who doesn't want to live in this tech world is is going to have a real battle. And so that you're right. I think as things get more extreme, as we have implants, there's certainly going to be a lot of resistance to that initially. But as with any network effects, it, once enough people have a particular form of technology at their disposal, it's going to be hard for the rest of us to say no. And the ones who do say no, I think it's going to be increasingly tricky for those people to live in the mainstream. As, as they become a shrinking minority. Think about Facebook as a good example. When Facebook started to take off, there were lots of people who didn't use it. It's kind of, for a lot of different audiences, it's not the big thing anymore, but but maybe six, seven, eight years ago, if you weren't on Facebook, it was like a big deal. It became a part of your identity. You can't just say, I'm gonna opt out without it becoming a major factor. So I think that's that's probably gonna happen more and more as these forms of tech become more intrusive. Yeah, technology is so embedded, social media in our culture that if you're not on it, like, where are you really? Are you taking part in the collective human experience that's going on at the time or are you not? Right. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's, it's um, you know, the, the, the concept of FOMO, a fear of missing out, I think is very acute in the tech era because there's so much that you could be doing at any moment. It used to be true. People used to say, you know, if you live in a big city, I, you know, there's so much going on at night. If I'm spending a night at home in my apartment or in my house, I, what else could I be doing? And there's FOMO. I feel like I'm missing out. But with tech, it's much more acute because the world goes on in the digital space 24 hours a day. There's always something going on on social media. Clubhouse is always ticking along, you know. And yeah, it's sorry. 10 times better than, than what's actually going on. At least it, it appears to be. <laughs> and it's made to seem that way, yeah. So there's this huge fear of missing out idea. Um, there's a new movement called JOMO, Joy of Missing Out, which tries to push back. Speaking of backlash, the idea that you are, there's joy in saying I'm going to opt out, you know. But obviously that's that's kind of, it's counterintuitive. It's not a movement that's going to really catch on in the same way as the, that very human sense that you're missing out. That's something that's very hard to resist. JOMO is a very intentional act. It's like an act of protest saying, I don't need screens, you know, I'm going to just embrace the here and now and sit and stare at a wall in my house or whatever you're going to do. Um, or live in the real world, sure, like, but at night or whatever, when you're, you're in your own apartment, there are certainly things you can do. But this idea of the, the joy of missing out, I think, is much more counterintuitive than the idea of just feeling like you're missing out. So now that we've seen both sides of the coin, how would you describe a really healthy relationship with one's phone? Hmm. So I think the clearest thing to do is to, to think of it almost like an act of accounting where you have the assets and the liabilities, the costs and the benefits. 
I think the, the best relationship with screens is the one where you extract all the benefits and extract almost none of the costs. And for many people, that calculus is off. You know, you take the benefits, you subtract the costs. For a lot of them, the costs outweigh the benefits. They're living in a kind of digital debt, and, um, and that's problematic. So I think, I think the best thing to do is to say, take, take, you know, you could do a little audit, again, using the accounting metaphor. What are all the things that I do on screens? Again, you could use your phone to tell you, here are all the things that I spend time doing. And once you have a sense of, of what you're doing on your phone or on your laptop or whatever it is you're using, your tablet, your TV, go through each one and say, what's the best thing on this and what's the worst thing on this? Like, what's the worst part about using it? What's the best part about using it? And then work out what proportion of your use is the best and what proportion is the worst. For me, when I use social media, on Twitter, I get more benefit. On Facebook, it's almost all cost for me. It's, everyone's different. Instagram, I don't really use, um, but I know for a lot of people, they like Instagram, they don't like Facebook. It's different for everyone. But I think it's, a, it's an individual question. It's a very personal question. But the, that to me is the key. If you could lay out all the, the strengths and the benefits uh, and the costs and the weaknesses and say what's the difference between them, the, the more the benefits dominate the, the weaknesses, the costs, I think the more you have found a way to kind of balance technology. We really have to look at it in this systematic way because if not, we can't rely on willpower or just like ourselves telling, okay, it's time to go now. We can't rely on that. I don't think so. Yeah. I think we have to do it more systematically than that. Not all the time, but it, at least to first get a sense of the issue, you have to be thoughtful about it. That's why getting the numbers from an, a phone where it says you spend six hours a day on average on social media, you're like, oh, I'm glad I now have the data. You need, you need that in the beginning. Once you know that, you can stop paying too much attention to the data. But in the beginning, that's the best way to get a sense of the picture of the landscape. Th thank you so much, Adam. Is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to promote specifically? Uh, nothing nothing specific. Um, I just want to thank you for, for having me on the show. I, I like what you guys are doing and uh, I appreciate your considering me and thinking of me. No, thank you, Adam. I think you're doing great work and we really need this in the, well, now and in the near future is just going to be more important to know these tools and how to manage our tech. I agree. Thanks, Antonio.